everybody, happy Tuesday. I hope you all had a wonderful weekend and enjoyed Monday's video. Um, I'm starting to put together kind of the stress-free holidays series that I talked about, so keep you know, your eyes peeled and subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Um, but I'll be putting out videos focused on holidays, um, some tips and tricks to stay as stress-free as possible during the holidays. Okay, so when it's Tuesday, I'm on Tumblr and I have three questions today as well as a journal topic. So let's get going. First question. Hey Katie, I was wondering what the difference is between psychologists and therapists. Like when you go to see one or the other, would they practice differently? Is it better to go see one rather than the other? This is a good question. I haven't talked about this in a long time. I think I put out one video, maybe it's treatment team way back in the day, like one of my first like 10 videos. Um, I talk about this and I don't know if I've talked about it since then, but the difference between a therapist and a psychologist is level of schooling. So I got my master's in clinical psychology with an emphasis in marriage and family therapists. Now social workers get the exact same thing except for theirs is a master in social work. So you can see how we're focusing on certain things. Now a psychologist goes on for two more years after me, so I got my master's, they get their doctorate and they become a PhD, or some people become a PsyD, which I'm not gonna get into the difference of those. One's clinical, one's more research-based, but a psychologist does pretty much exactly the same thing as a therapist does. Now, some people, when they get like, I don't know, people have egos about it. I personally don't. I considered getting my PhD, but the pay difference and the difference of what I do in my practice isn't that great. Um, psychologists do tend to, or at least in the past, they used to focus on testing and assessment. So because a PhD mean, means that you've done a lot more research and a lot of them spent time in labs and um, working in different research projects, a lot of them do different testing and assessment and they are able to do some testing that therapists aren't. However, it's more normal now for therapists to be certified to give out certain tests, to administer certain assessments and tests, and also for a psychologist to do the same. And then psychologists also do a lot of clinical work just like I do and see patients in their practice. So at the end of the day, there's really no big difference from what you would feel. The only difference is really what their degree is. Um, and then we really actually care more about how long they've been in practice, what their specialties are, and if we really jive with them, right? So yeah, so that hopefully answers some of that. And then if you've seen a psychiatrist, just to clear things up, they're a medical doctor. They're the only ones that can prescribe medication, the only ones that should actually talk to you about medication. And that's, like I said, psychiatrist, okay? Question number two. Hey Katie, in my last session, I ended up being there for an hour and 20 minutes. Wow, versus the usual 50 minutes. I didn't realize it had been that long and the next client was waiting when my therapist escorted me out. Is it normal to have a session this long? I really felt weird about it afterwards. The session was pretty intense and I'm assuming she wanted to make sure I was safe before I left, but I'm not sure. Do you ever get annoyed if you take longer than expected with a client? Thanks, and P.S. you're amazing. Oh, thanks, you're amazing. So, I thought this was a great question. I've never talked about this before. And to answer the one question, no, I don't get annoyed. It's actually therapist's choice to stay longer and to spend more time because let's be realistic. If we're running our you know business, our therapy practice, 50 minute hours, we are aware when we're running over because those 10 minutes are the time that I jot notes, I call patients back, I respond to emails. I'm doing stuff in those 10 minutes and it's tight as it is. So if I'm running over, it's usually because I feel the patient actually needs it. And it sounds like that if it was really intense, I have run over, I don't know if I've run over that far, probably maybe about that long. That's probably as long as I've run over. Um, but, but I would pop out and tell the person waiting, sorry, I'm running over, I'll be out in you know 15 minutes or whatever. But um, it's usually to make sure that you're safe and that things are okay. Because if I'm only seeing you once a week, then I want to make sure things are okay in the other six days in between when I see you. So that's really why we do it. I don't get annoyed. It's a choice that we make clinically as we're with you, noticing that if you need more time, you need a little extra, you know, processing. Sometimes clients even won't bring up big things or be able to even talk about something until towards the end. So then we barely get any time to process. And so that may be why we run over. Um, but yeah, it's our choice. It's not something that I get annoyed with. It's just something that happens because everybody's situation is different and some days can be really hard, okay? 
And I'm glad you have a good therapist who did that when you needed the extra time. Okay, question number three. Can you talk about how a married couple slash long-term committed relationship might deal with the strain of mental illness? Something other than just going to couples therapy? Thanks. Thought this was also a good question. Good questions, guys. Sometimes you have so many good questions. Um, the best way to talk about it is other than couples therapy. So let's say we've gone to couples therapy and we've learned some communication techniques because the thing that couples usually struggle with the most is bringing it up in the first place. Like, where do I even start? Ugh, so awkward. But if we've started with couples therapy, then we'll have already broken the ice, we'll have already started talking about it, we'll already have some verbiage that we've used, and we can go from there. So I would encourage you to set aside time, which I know sounds silly, whether you know you have kids or not, or you're living together or not, each, you need to set aside time each week where you just talk. Whether it's like a family meeting, or it's date night, or whatever you wanna call it, make sure you're setting aside time, because the difficult thing with life as we know it now is that there's so many distractions. I mean, I can sit on a subway and not talk to anybody because I can be on my phone, right? And I can be with my spouse or my boyfriend or girlfriend and we cannot even be communicating because we're watching TV or we're on our phones. And so we have to set aside time where we actually communicate, like a dinner every night where you don't bring your phones or an evening at home where you turn the TV off and you put your phones in the back room or whatever. That is pivotal because we really need to focus and have some good talk time, right? Now from there, the most important thing that you have to work on as a couple is honesty. Even when it can feel really uh, scary or embarrassing or whatever it may be, depending on what your mental illness is, the more we communicate about it. So let's give an example. So let's say we're struggling with anxiety disorders and we have bad social anxiety. Holidays are coming, we're getting party invitations, your spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend really wants to go to this one and you're like freaking out already. We need to have the verbiage when we have our meeting that week. Maybe we make notes during the week to make sure we don't forget anything. Then we need to say something like, this event's coming up and it's really giving me a lot of anxiety. And then we need to know what we need from them. That's the struggle most people have. When we're having some kind of issue or we need to communicate, we don't really know what we're communicating about or what we're asking them for or what they may need from us. So we need to find um, time to figure out what we need from them or even ask like, I may not know what I need from you, but kind of what I'm feeling now, ooh, sorry, I bonked my elbow. What I'm feeling right now is that I would just really like your support and I'd like to only stay for an hour or whatever. Um, and that's just one example. But the key of this being that we set aside time each week to communicate about things. We make notes during the week of things that we want to bring up and we keep talking about it. No matter how embarrassed you think you may be, no matter how uncomfortable the situation, no matter how much we're worried that we might let down our partner, at the end of the day, if we keep an open dialogue about, you know, I was really struggling with eating the other night and it was really great that you got seconds because then that gave me, you know, permission to eat. Whatever your issue is, the more we communicate about it, let each other know how much we appreciate them. Thanksgiving is coming up and it's a great time to remind those that we love, you know, how thankful we are for all the things that they do for us. But keep talking about it. Keep conversing with one another. If you're concerned, if you're the, the person in the relationship who isn't struggling with mental illness, it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to say, I noticed, you know, you're a little distraught the other day. Is it, is it your social anxiety? Is it your eating disorders? Your whatever. And as a person with it, we need to be able to hear that and to respond and for it to be okay to talk about it. It's the fear of talking about it that usually ruins relationships. Okay. Now, um, journal topic from anonymous. So thanks anonymous. You'll know who you are when I say it. It says possible journal topic, question mark. I think so. Sometimes journaling is really hard and you don't know where to start. I hear from a lot of you. I don't know where to start. My therapist had me, instead of normal journaling, write down song quotes like we were talking about last week and um, that I felt could really identify, that I could identify with. It was actually fun to come up with quotes and help me identify how I was feeling. I really, really liked that identifying how you're feeling, like 
finding songs that express an emotion to you, which can help us figure out what we're even feeling in the first place, which many of you have said you struggle with. So I thought that was really cool. I hope you like it and I hope you use it. And today is Veterans Day in the States. Um, and unfortunately I had to work today, but I wanted to thank all of our vets and their families for the sacrifices that they've given to us to keep us and our families safe and happy where we live. Um, I can't thank anybody enough for all of the sacrifices they've made, whether it's the life of a loved one or it's just time away from family. Um, it's something that I am so grateful for and I thank all of you for everything. Um, have a wonderful day, enjoy the evening, and I'll see y'all tomorrow. I'll be on the website and I'll be on YouTube. So ask your questions below today's video. Bye!